All righty, so I think we'll get started. Thank you everyone so much for showing up, whether it's Saturday morning where you are or Saturday afternoon or maybe evening somewhere around the world. Um, so thank you so much for coming. Um, this session is called A Spirit of Community, Scripts, Traditions, and Denison Library. My name is Anna Marie Wood. I am Senior Assistant Director of Admission here at Scripps, and I'm also a graduate of Scripps. Um, so I graduated in 2013. And so I'm excited to be here with you today to talk about what the Scripps community is like, uh, the traditions, history, and what it means to become a part of our community. Um, so I have a co-presenter with me and I will have her introduce herself uh, and then we'll take turns presenting, but there will be time at the end for questions and answers. Thank you, Anna Marie. I'm Jennifer Martinez Wormser. I'm the director of Denison Library at Scripps College. Like Anna Marie, I am also an alumna. Um, I graduated in 1995. Um, I actually worked at Denison Library as a student when I was on campus, and I came back to the college about a year and a half ago in my current capacity. So it's a, a wonderful place to uh, return to, um, as well as be a student at. So I'm delighted to be here with you today and to share some information with you about Denison. Um, Denison Library was the third building built on the Scripps College campus, and it is truly one of the most iconic buildings at Scripps. Um, it opened in 1931, and the architect is a man named Gordon Kaufman, and the building was designed in a cruciform shape of a chapel. So many people, when they first see Denison Library, they wonder if it, at some point it, if it had served campus as a chapel, but it was initially built as a library, um, and it always, always functioned in, in that capacity. But um, the donor for the building, Ella Strong Denison, for whom Denison Library is named, um, wanted to have a building that reminded her of a chapel she had seen on a travel trip to Spain many years before. And she loves stained glass windows. And so at the front of Denison Library is a gorgeous stained glass window that we call the Gutenberg window. And you can see it in the picture here in the slide. Um, and the Gutenberg window celebrates um, the history of the book and the, the written word. Um, and at the very, very bottom, which you cannot see in this image, is some text that says that the stained glass window is dedicated to the greater wisdom of women. Next slide, please, Anne Marie. Um, but Denison Library has for decades now been a, a space for study and research. Um, it is, a, like many libraries, it can be a quiet space of refuge um, if you want to get out of the dorms and away from your roommates where you can sit and reflect. Um, and because of its beautiful spaces and nooks and alcoves, um, it's a great place to, to surround yourself with, with learning and knowledge and, and the materials in the collection. Um, over the years, we've had a lot of faculty collaborate with the library to bring students into the space and use some of the rare and unique materials from our collections. And I'll be talking about those in just a few more minutes. Um, but we really think of Denison Library um, as more than just your typical library. It, it really is a laboratory for hands-on learning um, with and about rare and special collections materials. So if you've encountered primary sources before in some of your other research projects, that's really what Denison Library is all about. Let's take a look at the rare book room next, because that's one of my favorite parts of the library. So um, as I mentioned, if you caught the phrases special collections and primary sources, Denison Library is very unique in that it's a library filled with rare materials. And uh, some of the oldest things we have are from are actually cuneiform tablets um, from the years about 2000 BCE um, from the region that is today known as, as Northern Iraq. Um, and then we also have rare materials that quite literally were produced just last year. So um, we get a lot of questions about what is a rare book? What, what is a rare item? And a lot of that can vary based on the item's age or scarcity, um, who made it, who may have owned it before, um, the materials used. So um, in that sense, it's not always easy to nail down what a rare book is, um, but it's something that of course intrigues all of us and, and is great fun to explore. 
So on our next slide, you can see a class in the rare book room um, looking at some materials from our collections. And as I mentioned earlier, we think of Denison as a hands-on learning lab, and this is an example of, of us at work. Um, this photo was taken in February 2019, and you can see the students are bundled up, partly because it's February, but also because the rare book room is actually kept quite cold. We keep the temperatures lower in there to help preserve um, and slow down the, the aging of the materials that we have. Um, but on the table in front of the students, you can see uh, it kind of on the front right, there's a very small little book. That's a book from the 1300s. It's written in manuscript. And then right next to it, in the very, very front, is something that looks like a tin can. Um, and believe it or not, there's a little book in that can. And that book was made maybe only about 15 years ago or so. Um, so let's take a look at some of the collections that we have at Denison and better familiarize you with them. Um, as a women's college, of course, we've had a very strong collecting focus over the years on the history of women, women's education. Um, we have a lot of materials written by and about women, um, including archival and manuscript materials, some, neat, some really interesting letters. Um, the item you see on the left hand side of the screen is an example from our women's suffrage collection. Um, you may know that earlier this year in August was the 100th anniversary of women getting the right to vote in the United States. And this is a flyer from a little bit earlier than that when we were trying to get women to get the right to vote in California. And um, women actually got the right to vote in California earlier than the nationwide um, authorization of the 19th Amendment. So um, this particular flyer is in Spanish. Um, it's from 1911. And it's wonderful because, of course, it's, it's in Spanish and it shows the variety of prospective voters that people were thinking about in California at the time. Um, I mentioned earlier the rare book collection. And so the image on the bottom is an image of some of our fine bindings that we have in the collection. And of course, I think for a lot of people, when they hear the phrase or our book, this is the type of thing they, that comes to mind. They're beautiful and pretty um, and ornate in their design and, and craftsmanship. Um, uh, the larger image on the far right is one of our medieval manuscripts. Um, it's a book of music from Northern France um, from the late 1500s. And so the text that you see and the images you see were all done by hand. These are not things that were printed. Even though Gutenberg had invented the printing press by that point in time, um, things like large music manuscripts were still actually done by hand. Um, the book at the top is a little different and you may be wondering what that is because it doesn't look like a book, um, but it does look like a shiny red heel. And we'll talk about these in a, in a few more minutes, but um, we have a very well, well known and recognized collection of something called artist books. So tuck that away for now and we'll talk about artist books in just another minute or so. Our next slide actually shows books that have been made by um, students at the Scripps College Press. Um, starting in the 1940s, Scripps College uh, began a letterpress printing program and so over the years, we've had students make their own books, make their own posters and broadsides. And um, these are examples of some of those works that students have made over the years. And at Denison Library, we have a full um, collection of the materials made by those students. And this image shows some of our artist books. And I mentioned those materials before. Um, artist books are really very, very different and a lot of fun. And by far, these days are one of our most heavily used portions of our collection um, because they really blend well with the Scripps curriculum. They're very interdisciplinary in nature. Um, there's a lot of interaction and exploration in these materials. And what an artist book is, is truly um, an immersive experience in which the artist is using the form of the book um, to provide a vehicle for exploration of that subject. So looking at these images, you may find yourself thinking, well, that doesn't look like a book. That, I've never seen a book look, look like that. And that's okay. Um, but they are books. And some of them come apart in pieces. Some of them fold out. Um, the, the two on the bottom row, 
the lower left and lower center are what we call accordion books. They literally unfold like an accordion instrument. Um, but, you know, these are ways that the artists have chosen the book format to explore their subject in, in kind of an alternate, again, hands-on, immersive experience. Um, the one on the lower left that looks like a star, that's actually multiple sections that fold flat like pages. But when you open it up and put them together, it creates a structure that looks like a house. Super fun, super fun. On to the next slide, please. Um, at Denison Library, we also have the archives of Scripps College, and, and because of that, that means we're, we're sort of the, the keepers of the traditions at Scripps, uh, which is a great honor and, and a delight to be a part of. So you may already be aware of uh, or familiar with Ellen Browning Scripps, who is our namesake and founder of the college. Uh, she was born in 1836 um, and died in 1932. Um, unfortunately, because the college began late in her life. Um, she was never actually able to come to campus, but the very first class, which graduated in 1931, did go and visit her at her home um, and she served them cake. And so you can see an image of the first class uh, on the right in the slide here. And so when they started the college in the late 20s, they were really envisioning a, a, a campus that would uh, stop at 200 students. They felt that was enough. And so I think that Ms. Scripps would be very pleased and intrigued to see what the campus is like today with just over a thousand students and how dynamic it, it is and how much it has grown um, and how the curriculum has also shifted and changed over the years. But again, part of those archives is, is tracking that history of Scripps, tracking those unique stories of our faculty, of our students, and then, of course, as alumni later in their lives and the accomplishments that they have. And um, this last slide that I'm going to share with you is by far one of my favorites because, of course, part of what we do at Scripps is um, nurture and um, share ideas and help our students grow. And part of our Denison Library tradition involves their walking through the library um, at two very important times in their um, career at Scripps, as students at Scripps. And um, Anna Marie will talk about that a little bit more in detail, but I wanted to share this one in particular because this is the, the North Loja um, adjacent to the library and it faces our lovely Valencia orange tree courtyard next to the library where students like to study. But they walk through this space and they walk through the library. And even though you cannot see it in the slide, the door they pass through has an inscription up above. And I found it very inspiring as I, and when I was a student at Scripps and I still find it inspiring today. So I thought I would share it with you. Um, it's a quote from um, Alfred Lord Tennyson and it, it reads, knowledge comes, but wisdom lingers. And I feel that that is an appropriate quote to have at Denison Library. And I feel it also reflects um, the learning experience at Scripps College. So as those students process through the library space in their beautiful um, gowns on commencement day, um, I hope and think many of them look up at that inscription and think about knowledge that comes and wisdom that lingers both at Scripps and later in their life. So I'm going to turn it over to Anna Marie, who will talk a little more about that tradition with the, the students and the Denison Library doors. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Like every time I learn more about Denison and, and everything that is just special about it, it reminds me of just all the things I think make Scripps so special. Um, and so I'm going to spend a few minutes now uh, continuing, you know, where Jennifer left off talking about um, traditions and starting off with a tradition that we have as we were discussing with the Denison Library and the doors. So as you can see here on this uh, picture, Denison Library is beautiful entrance to these really beautiful, big, brown, wooden double doors. Um, but what's kind of interesting about these doors is that they're actually only open twice a year. They're open for first year matriculation and then for senior commencement. So normally when you actually you want to go into the library and either visit Jennifer or you know check out the space, you go in through this little, uh, you can see a little sidebar right here and enter in through the side. Um, so what happens with um, first year matriculation? <clears throat> 
is all the first year students line up um, and then they enter through these double doors. That's the first time of the year that the doors are open. Um, they sign this book that all Scripps students have signed. As you can see, they, there's a kind of a, a you know, processional and greeting each other, greeting faculty and staff. Um, even shaking our president, Laura Tiedens, the president is always at this event. Um, so you enter in through the library, you're greeting everyone. It's kind of an official like welcome to Scripps. Now you're here. Um, and then what you do is um, when you've entered in through those double doors, then you walk through the library, exit through the side, uh, and then there's a special just big, you know, kind of like a party, right? A, a dinner and a dance that's on the lawn. Uh, and again, it's just a celebratory, welcome to campus, you're here, and this is the beginning of your first year at Scripps. And then um, fast forward a few years when it's senior year at Scripps, uh, the doors are open again, these doors here. And you do the same thing, but in reverse. So you wear your seafoam green Scripps graduation gowns, you line up with your entire class, and you actually enter in through the side doors and then exit the way that you came in as a first year. Uh, and so this picture symbolizes the uh, seniors exiting through the double doors that they came in as a first year student. And so what I love about this tradition is I feel like it really highlights um, this idea of uh, coming into this community. Um, and I think it's very symbolic too that when you come into this community, your kind of official entrance or your official welcoming is through our library. So it symbolizes that you're gonna learn a lot and you're gonna grow a lot as a person, as a scholar, as a leader. And then when you're ready to leave scripts and embark on the world, you just exit the same way that you came. Uh, and I think that that's just a really powerful and special way and symbolic way of um, tying the four years together really neatly at Scripps. And um, something that I also like too about um, our, and there's another photo of the seniors at commencement. Um, and something that I like too about traditions at Scripps is that um, they're not set in stone. Uh, when you become a part of this community, it really is, you know, you, you become a part of the story and the history and the future of the college. And so what's great about that is that these traditions can change. Not all of them have been around since we were founded, right? And students get to be really active in this process um, and change things or, you know, spice things up a bit. And so I like to show this picture because uh, a fairly new tradition that's been added uh, to this idea of the, the double doors in Denison Library is actually something that happens in your sophomore year at Scripps. Um, so I forget how many years ago, but uh, sophomores started to, um, when they signed their major declaration form, so just some context, when you're a sophomore at Scripps, by the end of your sophomore year, that's typically when you declare your major. So you actually have the first two years at Scripps to kind of shop around and figure out what you want to major in, what academic subjects you like or what you don't like. I think also learning what you don't like to study is just as important as figuring out what you do want to study. Um, so by the time you are ready to declare your major, you go to the registrar's office and you sign this major declaration form. Um, and so sophomores over the last few years have been taking their major declaration form and taking a picture in front of the double doors at Denison Library and symbolizing, okay, now I know what I'm majoring in and, and here's a, you know, a way to celebrate that. Um, so I like this picture because I think it just shows like how happy students are in that process. And again, it's this, uh, the tradition started as your first year and your senior year, but why not add something in the middle, right? Um, and then, um, so, you know, we have traditions that happen, you know, just a few times during your time at Scripps, like the, the you know, the Denison doors, but we also have traditions that happen much more frequently. For example, Wednesday afternoon tea. If you were just at the uh, core curriculum session with Professor Winston Owen an hour ago, we were talking about how much we love tea. And, and he talked a lot about how he loved this, specifically the bread pudding at tea, which uh, when he said that, I was like, oh man, I really, really, I've been missing campus a lot, but I really miss campus right when he talked about bread pudding. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about uh, Wednesday tea. And so it's a tradition that we have at Scripps. Um, and it is kind of exactly how it sounds. It's a, it's a break in the middle of the week. Uh, tea happens every Wednesday from 3.30 to 4.30. Um, and what I love about tea is that typically if you have like a Wednesday afternoon class or something on Wednesday afternoon, uh, usually there's a break or oh, you're stop class. The professor will actually stop class and everyone goes to tea. I remember I had an anthropology class that so it was a Wednesday is I think from 2.45 to 5.15 or something like that. But we always stopped at 3.30 so we could all go to tea together as a class. And so the idea behind tea is it's just a it's time and space for the Scripps community to gather. Students, faculty, staff, um, you can mingle and just talk about how your week is going. 
it's also a really great way too to just um, I think inter especially interact with your professors on a more personal or like informal level. So you can see professors often bring their dogs or also uh, you know sometimes their children as well. And so just a great way to to interact outside of the typical like classroom or office hour setting. Um, that's what I loved about too is being able to, to chat with my professors and other script students uh, and staff at T. Um, and then T also usually has a theme too. Um, so usually T is hosted by a different office or a different uh, group on campus, or maybe there's some sort of, um, for example, this I believe is a, a research day where senior uh, script students presented the research that they did over the summer at T. And so students had different poster boards around the courtyard and people could go up and say, oh, tell me about your summer research or what you did this summer. Um, but sometimes you'll have, uh, you know, for example, the study abroad office may host tea. So you can learn about how to study abroad via scripts. Um, or our SCORE office may host tea. That's like our social justice hub. So you can learn about different events and programs and resources on campus. Uh, or maybe, you know, the Outdoor Wilderness Leadership Club will host uh, tea. And so you can learn more about outdoor expeditions and things that you can do in the Southern California outdoors. So it's just a great way to learn more about the scripts community, um, depending on who is hosting tea. Um, and this slide here, thing again shows, uh, you know, what's great about scripts is, you know, we're thinking about our, our history, but also present and future. And T is something that has been going on. I think, uh, Jennifer, I forget exactly how long T has been going on, but it's been going on for a while. I think since uh, the beginning, the, this image is from the 30s, but I think it's it's been around for a long time. And so as you can see, like the, you know, tea has really changed over the decades at Scripps, right? Maybe starting as more of a formal thing um, inside the residence halls, but then really transforming into the space um, where students and faculty are gathering. It's really informal, different snacks each week, different types of drinks each week. But the idea, regardless of it, you know, looks different and is, you know, the, the style of it is different. Um, the idea behind tea is still the same, which is a space for people to gather um, to check in with each other and see how the week is going. And again, just to learn more about our community. And then um, where I wanna end here is talking about, but this is probably, I, I feel like I say favorite a lot, but I think graffiti wall really is one of my favorite traditions. Um, and so you can see here, this is a spot on campus um, it, where uh, each graduating class gets a spot on this wall and they get to paint whatever they feel depicts their time on campus. So uh, a few slides that I have to show just different murals. Um, so what's, what's neat about Graffiti Wall is that it's really your class's chance to leave a message to the future Scripps community, to think about what inspired you during your four years at Scripps or what you were affected by during your four years at Scripps, right? So this wall is also a really neat collection of Scripps history. It's a neat collection of uh, American history and it's a really neat collection of world history. Um, so because students really kind of thought about, okay, what was happening while we were in college here and what is our mural going to look like? And typically what you do is so the cl your class decides, okay, what is the mural that we are going to paint? Um, and then you usually elect one student who's going to pa actually paint your class's mural. So this is the class of 2019. Um, and so each class gets a spot on this wall. And then once you've decided what your, what your mural is going to be, and then a member from your class paints it, and then the seniors actually line up, I think it's like the day or two before graduation, and you sign your name next to your class's mural. And some of these murals are quirky and lighthearted. Um, so for example, I, I love this one. It says, yes, you'll miss us when we're gone. And it's right above the doors that actually exit and you leave Scripps' campus. Um, so that's one of my favorite murals. Um, this is also one of my favorite murals. It's from the class of 1977. With women like these, failure is impossible. I really like this one because I feel like it really encapsulates the camaraderie and the spirit of a woman's college community um, and just what, what it feels like to go to Scripps and what it feels like to go to a woman's college. Um, but some of these murals are, um, you know, really, I think, it, like, you know, lighthearted or really sweet in this way, but also a lot of these murals are more serious, uh, even political, challenging. So, for example, you know, you could see the, this is a classic graduate in the 1960s and, and what was important to them. Uh, the class that was, you know, graduated in 2011, you can see what they were affected by. Uh, this is the one where you saw the student as uh, she, she was beginning the painting, um, different issues that really affected Scripps students during this time. For example, um, drop Sodexo. And so this, the, what I love about this mural is that on each of these, um, you know, little, um, what are they called? Uh, the 
uh, the, these leaves, um, you know, they really represented the issues that they were talking about during the four years at Scripps uh, and what they were passionate about and what they wanted to change. And Scripps students are very active. Um, and so, for example, Drops at Exo references are dining hall services that our students gathered together and protested and wanted Scripps to remove our contract with our dining hall services provider and find a new dining hall services provider. And it was successful and it worked. And now we have a different dining hall services provider. Um, so this gives you a sense of just what Scripps students cared about and what they are passionate about uh, and how they thought about the world around them. And as you can imagine, the class that graduated this May was affected by COVID. And so what I love about this mural of the class of 2020 is that it's a face mask, but it has flowers growing out of it and thinking about the future and hope and, you know, and just what, what the future may hold. And so this is what I love about traditions at Scripps is like, yes, you know, you think about our history a lot and, and who came before you, um, but you also get to leave your mark on this campus and you get to think about what this place means to you. Uh, and when it's time for your class to do their mural, you really, you get to think about what message do we want to leave to the Scripps community so we can inspire future decades of Scripps students to really think about what this place means to them. And so when we talk about history and traditions at Scripps, I think it's really all comes down to becoming a part of the community here um, and becoming a part of the, you know, the, the fabric of our student life and just thinking about uh, life inside and outside the classroom and becoming part of the uh, present and also the future of the Scripps community. So I think I'll stop there. And um, I want to thank you again, Jennifer, for presenting about Denison Library and, and history and traditions. And uh, students, if you have questions, feel free to type them into the chat box um, or to the Q&A box. And I think I already see one. Um, and we can answer questions. We actually have two questions in the chat. Um, and so maybe if you don't mind, Anna Marie, I'll go ahead and answer Jane's question first. Um, Jane asked about further explain, uh, wanted a, a larger explanation about artist books and uh, the subjects. Um, and yes, I know you got a very kind of brief high level explanation of them, but I don't know if, if you were looking closely at those images or not, but um, the art, when I was talking about the, the topic and the format and the subject and how they blend, um, for example, one of the images that was an accordion book in the bottom center of the slide, if you notice, it was a little round one and it looked like a, like a makeup compact case. Um, and then the accordion book folded out of it. That's actually a book called Looking at Makeup. And um, it's a book that explores ideas of, of women, uh, cultural uh, constructs of beauty and identity um, and the, the tools that women use. Uh, commonly called makeup. And so in this case, the, the artist has taken um, a compact that probably was purchased at our local, you know, uh, Walgreens or Target or something, and, and removed the contents and used that as the cover um, for the book. So again, an artist book is, is, uh, is very thorough in its thinking. Um, the other book with the red shoe, that's actually titled The Red Shoe Reader. And it's a book about all of the, the um, various historical and cross-cultural ways that women have um, uh, identified with and used different types of footwear uh, over the years, uh, most of which can be quite damaging. And so that book um, has images of different types of shoes, whether it was uh, related to foot binding in China or Marilyn Monroe and her high heels and um, there are flaps in within that book. So you may see the image of Marilyn Monroe standing in her high heels, but then when you flip the flap up, you will see perhaps an X-ray um, of a woman's foot and, and the bone structure and how it's been affected by wearing those high heels over a period of time. So there's, you know, there's an analysis and criticism within that publication um, along with the text that goes with it. So, so again, they're very clever, and um, and I think they're they're really interesting in in terms of the thought process behind behind the construction itself. Thank um, you. We have so many questions now. Yeah, I was going to say, if you don't mind, Anne Marie, I'll go. I'll I'll start with the first the question from Jane about five C communities and specifically about Denison, but then maybe you should answer in about kind of the broader scripts and five C communities and how they interact. Um, but Jane asked a question about the Scripps community and its blending with five C's. 
um, and, and asked if a lot of other 5C students use Denison. Yes, Denison, um, even though it is on Scripps campus and it is the Scripps College Library, we are open to all students, um, faculty and staff at the Claremont Colleges. And in fact, we are open to, to the general public as well, although we have, we have fewer visitors um, from that particular constituency. But yes, we have students who are welcome to come in and use um, the space as a study space. And then because of our cross registration system with the curriculum, we get plenty of classes that come into Denison Library to use the materials and often we'll have students from the other campuses in those classes. Um, I'll tell you, I do get some students who come into the library and they're super cute because uh, maybe I'll be walking by or, you know, push, stop and push in a chair and I'll say hello. And some of them will say, I love coming here. And I'll say, oh, that's wonderful. So do I. And then they'll, they'll kind of giggle and they'll say, but I'm from Pomona or I'm from Pitzer. <laughs> and I'll say, that's totally fine. I'm glad you're here and you found the best place on all the campuses. And then generally speaking, yeah, I mean, the, with the Claremont Colleges community, it really is the, the, cliche, phrase, the cliche phrase, best of both worlds. Um, so as much as you, uh, you know, can choose to be, of course, active in the, the Scripps community, you really can, and it's very easy to, and very much a part of the culture to be active in the Claremont Colleges community. Whether that's what's, you know, we, ha we have um, clubs and organizations at Scripps, uh, but then there's also five college student-led clubs and organizations, in addition to cross-registration opportunities across the schools, athletic opportunities, 17 different dining halls and eateries across the schools. So in terms of the community, um, community at Scripps is, can be, you know, just hanging out at Scripps and, and being involved in the Scripps traditions like we talked about, um, but uh, very much so also being engaged with students from the other schools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then um, I'll go ahead and take, I saw an, an, another question that I um, actually meant to address during the presentation, which was about how are you trying to maintain traditions during COVID or being virtual? Uh, and, that, and that's actually a good point um, because uh, yeah, there, there are ways that we have done that. Um, for example, you know, we're not on campus now. We are, we've been remote since March. Um, not sure if we, when we'll go back, but, but so we are virtual for the, this fall semester. Wednesday afternoon tea is something that we continued almost every Wednesday of the summer as doing, a, doing that virtual. And also the last slide that I showed, which was um, the class of 2020's graffiti wall mural. Um, that one actually isn't, isn't physically on the wall right now it's a rendering of the um of the the mural and uh, what i meant to say is there's uh, on our website there is a rendering of what that mural looks like on the wall but it's not actually on the wall yet so we've been able to maintain some things um i don't know if jennifer there's anything else you want to add about you know scripts and being virtual and keeping up that mm -hmm. community um i can tell you in terms of our our instruction sessions that we do at denison again all those classes that come into the library to to explore Denison materials. Um, we've moved to a Zoom-based format. Um, it's a little bit different, but there, there have definitely been some pros and cons associated with it. What I, what I really like the best, um, as someone who's speaking to a group of students, you know, whether it's a class of eight or a class of 18, um, when a class comes in, maybe that's my one chance to meet with that group during the semester, or, or I have some faculty who bring them in maybe for a longer term project, they may come in two or three times and I get to know the students names. I'll tell you with Zoom, it's been great because their names are on the screen. And so I feel like my dialogue with the students in terms of our conversations about artist books or archives or whatever it is we're discussing, it, I feel like it's a little more personal because I can say, oh, you know, so and so, that's a great question. And, and for me, it's actually been a great way for, for me to better relate names and faces of the students because I see a lot of students come in, um, but I don't always learn their names and, and I, wish, I wish I did. So that's, that's been very helpful for me. Um, but again, we've, been, we've also stepped up the Denison Library um, social media starting this summer. We've been really trying to connect our community to the collections a little bit more because we recognize that when we're all physically on campus, people may just drop by or wander in or come and hang out. And, and so the, the serendipity that happens through that type of opportunity um, obviously is a little trickier to capture uh, through Zoom. And yet we also said, well, let's, let's try to share more of our materials through social media. We also started an electronic newsletter. Um, the first issue came out in September 
and it's been well received. And we've also switched some of our programming. Um, so last year we had a kind of spooky-ish Halloween themed event in the library that was late at night and we had our cobwebs out and we had some, uh, you know, books with skeletons and the like out on display and people could come in and, and interact in the space with the materials. This year we're transitioning to a virtual escape room that is um, built with Denison Library as its uh, backdrop. I don't want to re reveal too much. Um, but again, it's been a lot of fun to think creatively about how else we can engage with, with the community. And that too, the escape room's open to everyone. It's not just Scripps students, it's whoever wants to do it. So like I said, the, the challenges have been, have, are there, but we found some, some new ways to engage. Let's see. Um, there's quite a few questions. Um, Tiffany, maybe you'll answer this one, but it says, how do anthropology students engage slash use the library or engage with mm -hmm. uh, the library as a resource for research? Mm -hmm. um, I would say with respect to, and specifically anthropology as a subject, um, a lot of that, again, is probably more driven by the faculty member who works with us to identify what parts of the specific course um, are related to or the collections in some way. So um, some of that may be coming in and looking at books. Maybe they may be looking at books related to um, certain sites or certain locations in the world or certain cultures. Um, also, there has been a, a lot of interest on the part of the faculty in terms of looking at older publications that may have a certain um, colonial perspective, for example, um, that may not be a perspective that others may have today regarding a, a certain culture or a certain space. But it's interesting to be able to look at those sort of uh, alternate and varying narratives uh, regarding um, different communities and cultures and, and traditions. We also have some nice photographic materials uh, in, in fact, uh, the Balches, Mr. and Mrs. Balch, from whom Balch Hall is named, uh, have some fantastic photographs uh, from around the world uh, from the early, very early part of the 20th century. And um, we've been getting more interest in that particular collection. Um, for regular, what I would consider regular research, um, of course, the Claremont College's library is the student's primary go-to place for things like database articles, and you know, current academic publications for the subject matter, not just anthropology, but but other subjects as well. These are fantastic questions. There's another yeah. one that I can start and then feel free to add. Um, are there many lectures or, or discussions held in the college that invite uh, like celebrities in various fields, such as some philosophers or sociologists? So Scripps does have a variety of different speaker series, which I think quite a few of those we've been able to still hold virtually. Mm -hmm. um, we have Scripps Presents. Um, we have um, a Tuesday Noon Academy. Um, we have a, we also have a Clark Humanities Museum. We have a Humanities Institute that invites speakers um, throughout part of that program. So yeah, there's a variety of people. Um, I can speak, what comes to mind uh, initially is this, the Scripps Present series, mm -hmm. which invites various storytellers, mus musicians, policymakers, people just across various fields um, to either come to campus or to come to campus virtually uh, and speak about their stories. Some notable speakers include um, Kevin Kwan, who wrote Crazy Rich Asians, uh, Nancy Pelosi, Lena Waithe, uh, the first black woman to win an Emmy for um, outstanding writing in the comedy series. There's also Michael Barbaro, if you like podcasts, he does the New York Times The Daily podcast. So just a lot of different people from different fields um, sharing their stories. So I don't know if there's anything else you want to add about, um, mm -hmm. you know, speakers. And, and I'd say the, the, the slightly smaller scale ones that are still out there um, are a lot of department level speakers as well. So we'll have faculty members who will invite a colleague or someone in their field to come and give a talk. Um, the EU Center at Scripps is, has a speaker series as well. I attended one earlier this month on um, Black Lives Matter in Europe that I thought was really interesting. Um, and, you know, again, I think that there's a lot of a lot of initiative on the part of the faculty and a lot of opportunities um, for speakers to come to campus. Uh, over the decades, the college has established, you know, several 
they've had several speaker series often established through the generosity of donors and alumni. So we know, for example, every year in February, where there's an annual Sojourner Truth Lecture, um, often focused on Black women, um, and that has been going on for many decades. Um, so again, depending on the subject, like we had an inquiry about anthropology earlier, there could very well be an anthropology lecture somewhere on the Scripps College campus, or again, at another college campus. And that's, I think, part of the, the great fun and variety of that, that broader Claremont community um, is that you can go, you know, you can go to a lecture in the afternoon that's being held at Scripps, but maybe that evening you might go to a dance performance at one of the other campuses. And um, I've been pleased with how they've even managed to do some of the performing arts performances during our, our closure time of COVID. So I, I believe there's a, a musical performance tomorrow afternoon that's two faculty members, for example. And I just included some links in the chat um, in case you want to further look at some of these resources and virtual events and things. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a question that says, would you be able to talk a little bit about Scripps' small grade sizes? How does that factor relate to Scripps and the consortium as a whole? Uh, yeah, I can start out with that question. Um, you know, Scripps is, uh, we've definitely grown since when we talked about the original size of the College of Caffeine at 200. We're just about a thousand students. Um, each class here is really going to vary. I'd say it's around 300 students. Um, so we are a small college. Uh, with the Claremont Colleges together, I believe it's about maybe 7,000 students. Um, so it's a fair really, you know, small but mid-sized uh, university setting. So uh, that's again where the cliche phrase comes into play, the best of both worlds, because Scripps maintains its identity as a small college with the benefits of everything that that comes with, right? Access to research, small discussion-based classes, knowing your professors, things like that, knowing the people in your year. When I was graduating from Scripps, I don't know if Jennifer, you felt the same, mm -hmm. but I, I didn't know everyone in my class. It's impossible to know all, uh, you know, two, 300 ish people, but I felt like I could recognize most people. And there was only, I feel like a few people where I'm like, oh my God, who are you? I don't know who you are. Um, but it, so, so again, small school, but what feels bigger is when you have the opportunities across the Claremont colleges too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would say when I graduated, I think we had maybe about a hundred and 60 or 80 in my graduating class. So I, I really did know everyone. Um, and, and again, I think that's where that, that sense of community comes. You know, it's not so small that you feel like you're all in each other's business. It's large enough, there's a lot of variety and a lot of people that you can meet across the colleges. Um, but, but you do have that, that shared sense of community and experience with your Scripps, fellow Scripps students. And even if they're not in your major, or even if you never lived in the same residence hall, you know, maybe you had a core class with that student, or maybe you did an intramural activity with someone. Um, so there are lots of opportunities to get to know other students in other contexts. And, and I always appreciated that. So I think we probably have time for one more question. Um, we actually, there's, we, there's one about the importance of the tiny book inside the can. Um, and then there's oh. also a question about, is there work study available? So if you want to just give me a yes or no, Jennifer, if there's a work study available at the library and I can type I, out. I can, I can do both. That's a, those are both easy questions. Um, yes, we, we do hire, we still hire student workers, thank goodness. Um, and yes, we have work study students. And uh, we're very pleased actually this semester, even with our remote, in our remote COVID environment, we were still able to hire some work student, work study students who are working remotely for us um, as I speak. So uh, yes, student employment is, is an important part of Denison. Um, the little book inside the can, oh, so cute. Okay, so I just had to tell you again, this is back to that question we had earlier about um, form and meaning. So. You may be familiar with a book by John Steinbeck called, called Cannery Row. And it's about uh, sort of the fishing community in, in central California in kind of the Monterey Salinas area. Um, this little book is an accordion style book. So it folds out, but it comes in a round can like the size of a tuna fish can. And when you, when you take the book out, the boat, what we would call the boards, the covers of the book are round circular pieces like pieces of a can and it is a book inspired by cannery row so the book artists are peter and donna thomas they're from santa cruz california which is just north of of that monterey area 
And they've done beautiful little illustrations and they've done their, their printing. And again, you open up the can and, and the book and it opens up um, almost like a garland at a birthday party. And you see their lovely little illustrations inspired by Steinbeck's Cannery Row and that region of, of central, the central California coast. Um, and so, it, you know, I'm not truly allowed to have a favorite because everything's so marvelous, but it is truly on my, you know, top 10 list of, of fun, fun books at Denison. So I'm glad you asked about that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for um, this. Thank you so much for coming to the session, everyone. Thank you, Jennifer, for presenting and, and asking and answering all the questions. These were fantastic questions.